All right, ask and you shall receive. This was a college essay I had to submit for our audience research and marketing. Money is a strange thing when you're supposed to be playing a world that immerses you in cool visuals, amazing world building, and hidden lore. It's weird to be talking about this cool new underwater civilization, then have to whip out your credit card to indulge in some classic loot box gambling. But with the rise of gacha games and the coming of Genshin Impact's plot for world domination, I think it's finally time to address the interesting psychological tactics that these little games use to keep you wishing. Welcome to how the gacha system pulls you in, the casino psychology. Today, I want to discover small techniques that real-life casinos and marketings use to pull users in, and how it has strange parallels in Genshin's own gacha system. Disclaimer. This video isn't a criticism of the gacha system itself, and I'm not trying to make it out like Mihoyo has this overlord anime villain monologue about brainwashing people and just spending money. In my opinion, if a game is good, it deserves to be successful, and the Genshin Impact is a great example of how the gacha isn't the game. Additionally, what I'm about to say to you are just parallels of simple marketing. These correlations may or may not just be coincidences. However, I believe that as an audience, it's important to have a firm level of self-awareness when it comes to marketing strategies. This game involves real-life money and can have dire consequences if a person's behavior is heavily influenced by some hot anime husbando. If I disappear within the next week, assume I'm dead. So, let's begin. When people think about the word gacha, the first thing they think of is the word gambling, which isn't far-fetched. Both rely on probability to get a certain item rather than paying upfront for that item like in a store. But there's a key difference between casino gambling and loot box gambling that splits the two apart. The existence of a consolation prize. Most casinos don't offer a consolation prize when you lose. For example, there's always a guarantee to get nothing in a game of slots or poker or blackjack. But in a gacha game, most of them offer lower tiered constellation prizes like the 3 star weapons or a mona or a 4 star. There's a guarantee you're getting to get something. It may not be what you want, but it's there. But that's where the biggest difference ends. I'm just going to come out and say this. The gacha system is meant to be addictive. From banner sales to reward distribution, the system itself tries to be as immersive and as enticing as possible. There's a reason why the game showcases featured characters in story content, why limited 5 stars, except Kazuha, have a dedicated story quest upon release, and why Shenha, Kazuha, and Yunjin are featured in Archon quests that are played next to their banners. The key in gacha games is to appeal to the audience as much as possible by showcasing their characters as frequent as possible. But that isn't groundbreaking claims, so let's dive a little deeper. It's time to dissect the Genshin Impact experience from beginning to late game and correlate it with subtle marketing techniques that are used to establish a loyal player base. The gacha experience is mainly separated into three key tactics to reel a player in. The initialization phase, the psychology of perceived value, and the rewarding of long-term loyalty. So, let's begin with the most important tactic, the initialization phase. The initialization phase refers to the beginning of a player's experience, and this is the most important part. If you can't keep your audience hooked on the first moments of your game, more likely than not, they won't stay. In Genshin, it's easy to say that cool cutscenes and amazing graphics are the best way to hook a player into the gaming experience, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I mean is that you need to hook the player immediately to the feeling of pulling for characters. Consider this. Why do we have the beginner's banner with Noel? Why are we given pulls at the very beginning of the game? Well, it's to introduce us to the gacha system. When you start the game, you are immediately told at AR7 how the gacha system works, and that if you pull and spend wishes, you're guaranteed to get a free geo made. Easy, right? Well, real life casinos also exploit this kind of tactic by giving players free drinks and beginning pots to start playing in the casino. They give you just enough so that you learn how the system works, and just enough to get that dopamine rushing. Genshin's starting phase has numerous free rewards like a free temple at ER7 and 10, and numerous beginner's codes that are everywhere when you install the game. It's a free advertising technique that's almost everywhere on Genshin YouTube ads. I'm sure you've used Genshin GIF at least once in your life. By making the player feel that their pools are free or are given to them, they make the currency feel cheaper than what it really is. Beginners don't fully understand how valuable Primo gems are in the long run because they're showered with them constantly in the beginning. Chests, mail, Archon quests, 
160 Primo Gems is easy to garner at the beginning of the game because of all the content, but in the long run, veteran players realize how valuable each Primo Gem can be. The goal of the initialization phase is to reel you in as fast as they can to the idea of wishing. Now, this doesn't immediately mean spending money, by the way, because that's going to happen in the late game, not the early game. The house just needs you to familiarize yourself with just how good the feeling of pulling for your favorite four star truly is. Which brings me to the mid game experience. What makes you roll in a banner? Well, you like the character. You like Kazuha because of his high output damage, or Yaimiko because of her aesthetic, or Tartalia because of his story. But that's not the full reason. There's a reason you're compelled to believe that this block of pixels is important, and that's because of a marketing phenomenon known as the psychology of perceived value. Now, what I'm about to tell you isn't some Mihoyo witchcraft where they manipulate you into rolling because Eula flies or something. It's a really common practice for advertising. In marketing, the psychology of perceived value is the key aspect to establishing a brand. For example, Apple is a brand that may be selling computers, but its name invokes feelings of luxury, innovation, and status. The psychological effect is what makes consumers believe what they have is worth the price they are paying. Conversely, it's also why people can say they don't like Kokomi, but some do. It's a subjective phenomenon. Gacha games do their best to monetize this psychological effect deeply. Most of the reasons gacha players pull is because of characters. Even if you've pulled for a weapon, your intention is to up a character's damage because you're dedicated to them for whatever reason. The key to increasing a character's value is by creating a personal atmosphere for the characters, whether they're visually appealing or they have a compelling story or they're very powerful. In Genshin, a character is given one main quest each to increase appeal, besides Kazuha. They are also given specific animations and advertisement material to showcase snippets of their main story. By doing so, the player has an additional reason to pull for them if they like their personality. Unfortunately, this does mean that a character's reputation is linked directly to their sales, and Mihoyo can make narrative sacrifices just to appeal to the audience. But another factor that adds to the perceived value of an item is its limited status. Gacha games only feature the demanded character for a set amount of time, creating artificial hype and an urgency to spend. This is why we have people that fall into impulse the more they see the timer on the banner. It's easier to fall into the hype train when you know there's a deadline. This also works well with the spiral abyss working for the limited banners. As a tangent, when you're constantly bombarded with positive response for this character, or have seen other people be lucky or get a C6 of a character based on polls, it compels you to stay in the system. Yes, it doesn't work for each character as a one-to-one. -one. For example, I see someone rolling for a C6 Kokomi doesn't mean I want to spend my money immediately for that C6 Kokomi, but rather it psychologically tells you that pulling for characters can make me happy. As long as you're exposed to the wishing system, it's not a matter of if you're pulling, it's a matter of when. Fun fact, it's actually not a good idea to pull on the Noel banner as opposed to just rolling immediately on the standard banner. Sure, you get Noel, but it's more important that you start building pity in the standard banner for the long run, since that's still 20 wishes. Which brings me to the last and certainly not the least. This is my personal favorite tactic that most casinos use. It's the rewarding of players for long-term playtime and spend. This is where the famous, oh, I'll just buy one Welkin Moons, or oh, I'm just building pity. Gacha games tend to have a pity system, in which if you pull a certain amount of times, you are guaranteed to gain your desired item. Now, this can be seen as a safety net, and if you think that, that means the system's psychological effect probably worked. It's known as the sunk cost fallacy. It's really deadly when left unchecked and can definitely lead to some horrible addictive behavior. This is most referred to when going to casinos and the leading cause of gambling-induced debt. This is a phenomenon that states that a person can be reluctant to abandon a strategy they have heavily invested in. Gamblers tend to double down in purchases once they are in the middle of a losing streak, and the rush to get a large win becomes asserted. You know, the classic Pepega swipe. For example, if I'm a free-to-play and I get to 75 wishes for Kazuha, there will be a small chance and temptation to just buy a small pack of Primo Gems to try and get him. After all, I'm going to reach self-pity anyway, so why not? These tactics that I've laid out for all of you are just the basics. There are more intricate systems that I'm sure Mihoyo's marketing team found out if they can make a game whose gross revenue is over a billion dollars. But why am I telling you this? 
Obviously, these tactics in small doses aren't inherently bad. They're basically marketing techniques. Just because they play Genshin Impact doesn't mean you sold your soul to the devil. No. I showed you all these tactics in the hope that you will become a little self-aware in the environment you are actively engaging yourself in, so that in the future, when you do spend money in Genshin, it's because you made educated and informed risks. The biggest takeaway for any game or any purchase is simple. It's moderation. If you can afford to spend some extra money to support a game that you like, go for it. But if you're just spending money to not fall behind, or because you need a C6 Ganyu for her damage, or because you've already put too much resources into building pity, take a step back. The best way to spend money in games you like is to know what you're getting into. Save and spend responsibly. Good gacha games can still be enjoyed for their content. And I don't think spending money on games is a bad habit as long as you enjoy your playthrough and practice self-control. My name is Aster, and thank you for chilling with me.